What's up? This is Dan Fradenberg from figureitout.com, and today I'm with Tim Brotz. If you're in Ohio and you're in multifamily real estate, you already know who Tim Brotz is. But thanks for being here, Tim. Uh, one thing I like to do on this show to teach our audience, and most guests don't know that I do this, is I get them to introduce themselves because I think it's one of the most important skills you can have. And I know you're probably the best prepared guest I've had for this. So I'd like you to show them how it's done. Can you introduce yourself, please, Tim? No, I'm Tim Bratz. I'm, a, I'm a, a blue collar kid from Cleveland, Ohio originally, um, and uh, got started in residential real estate about 12, 13 years ago really started focusing on apartments around seven, eight years ago. And uh, that's what I do now. So I, I, I focus exclusively on apartments. I got a portfolio of a little over 4,000 units, uh, about $350 million of valuation. And what I'm most proud of though, is like the way that we bought, you know, we buy in a very, um, uh, a very conservative, uh, mitigated risk type of fashion that keeps uh, our, our all in cost basis fairly low. So we're all into our properties typically for about 60, 65 cents on the dollar. So on $350 million of valuation, we really only own, I'm sorry, we really only owe to debt and equity investors around two, two and a quarter, somewhere in that ballpark. So, uh, but yeah, man, that's what we got going on. Right. And, and you, your company focuses on legacy wealth, which is basically what you were getting at, which is buying with the focus of increasing your wealth rather than constantly focusing on income because, and, and I believe the reason is because wealth has a, a far reduced tax burden in comparison. Now, do you think that's really an oversimplification or like you think it's okay or what? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, absolutely. Like my, my goal is to build wealth, not to get rich. My, build, my goal is to build legacy wealth that's going to transform um, not only my family's financial future, but a lot of other people's too and, and our investors and my joint venture partners and my team. And uh, I, I don't think you do that by doing transactional deals. I think money today um, is good, but it's kind of easy to make money today. You can wholesale, you can flip, you can do all those kinds of things. If you focus on money tomorrow, it's multiplied or maybe even exponentially multiplied um, to the way that, that uh, you know, you're, you're, you're delaying your gratification, you're delaying your, your, um, uh, your wins until tomorrow. And it just, it becomes more and it's amplified in a way that, um, uh, it, it, that's how real wealth is built. I think you, you create wealth by buying assets that create enough value for other people that they're willing to pay you for your asset. And that's what commercial real estate does for, for us. Like if you think about it, <laughs> like we buy a property and we, we make it nice, we make it clean, safe, functional, cosmetically improved. And people are willing to come in and pay us on a monthly basis mm -hmm. that covers our cost to own that asset. It covers our cost to, to buy that asset, it covers all of our debt service, covers all of our operating expenses, and it puts cash in our pocket every single month. Then, you know, we're paying down principal every month that our tenants pay our mortgage for us. Uh, the property appreciates every year as their rent increases with, with um, inflation. And over the course of time, all of a sudden, you have this big spread of what you owe on the property versus what it's worth, and that is how wealth is created. You've had all the tax advantages throughout the own life of your ownership and all the other benefits that come with it. Um, real estate, it, it, if there was something better out there, I, I've dedicated my life to financial, um, uh, um, personal finance and wealth building. If there was something better out there, I'd be doing it, right? But I think commercial real estate is um, the best vehicle to, to generate massive wealth long-term. Yeah, yeah, and I'd have to agree. And, and Tim, you know that I came into real estate from tech. But you got onto my radar because uh, I, like, I have to do big deals to replace my tech check. And, and I have to fast track the leveling up in real estate. But, but I found that uh, a lot of people, you know, the, the, the real estate company that, uh, that I worked for like seven years doing the tech for them, uh, they're single family people. Uh, they're, they're, they're recently making more jumps into apartments and stuff like that. But I find that uh, in the community of single family people, they're afraid of making the jump to commercial. And I think the word commercial is a big part of that. I think it sounds scary to them. But what do you, what do you say to people who think that commercial sounds way too intense? Yeah, I, I think probably where my niche in really the education market has come in is because I come from the residential side and I've never been to a course. I've never read a book on commercial real estate. I've, I just took the same concepts that I did in residential and I, I conveyed them to my commercial investments. And because I can simplify things, I think a lot of people build up apartments and commercial real estate to be this, this overly complex and overly complicated type of thing. 
It doesn't need to be. Like, it, it's only as complex as you make it, it ought to be in your own mind. Um, the reality is it's very similar to buying rental properties that are single family. The difference is there's more zeros and there's a few more line items, right? Like there's more, there's not just one rental income. There's a lot of rental incomes. There's not just one source of income, which is rents that now you have laundry income and you have maybe marketing income, maybe you have parking income, maybe you have um, uh, uh, billboard income, maybe you have cell phone tower income. There's a lot of different things that you can generate income from on commercial real estate. And then, you know, on the expenses, typically it's management, you know, or uh, uh, maintenance management, uh, taxes, insurance, utilities on, on a single family house. On multifamily, there's a few more things. You got some payroll expenses, you got marketing expenses, you have more accounting expenses and admin type stuff. But it's just, there's more income, there's more expenses. But at the end of the day, you all you care about is the net operating income on these properties. And then a multiple of that of whatever market that you're in. Uh, is what gives you the valuation. So it's still very easy to, to um, do it. There's just a couple th more things to add, a couple more things to subtract. But at the end of the day, it's what is the net operating income and what is the, the multiplier of that in whatever market that you're investing in? So um, again, it doesn't have to be as complex. There's definitely nuances into moving into it, but I actually think it's easier to do big deals than it is to do small deals just because of all the economies of scale and the efficiencies that come with having a lot of units in one location versus having to drive all over uh, to manage and, and operate the property. So um, right. I, I love commercial men. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the other thing I think you mentioned is, uh, is uh, a reduced amount of red tape in a lot of cases, right? Big time. Cause, Big, yeah. Because yeah. that, that's stuff that, you know, like all my gray hairs, I don't have many for my age, but, but I do have them. Most of them are from taxes as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but back to, to, to be an entrepreneur, uh, you have to open yourself to risk, right? And, and even something like this show for me, like I'm doing a year of topics, uh, like one topic per day uh, in these daily videos and, and interviews like this on top of that. And all of this is on my own dime. So you might say that uh, I'm not taking that much risk, but it's possible that my show is too weird and it falls flat on its face and I look like a dumbass. But, but you, sir, are buying and fixing and operating apartment buildings, which many would say is an even bigger risk. So investors these days, uh, from, uh, they, they tend to be more concerned about inflation than like a stock market crash, but, but both of those are great for real estate. But, but what's your guess for the rest of 2020 right now, like as a feeling? Yeah, I, I think, um, so there's risk in, in doing anything, right? There's risk in having a job. What if you, <laughs> your company fails? What if your boss is an asshole? What if you get fired? What if like, there's a lot of other, like um, yeah, I'd rather got control my risk me than somebody else controlling it, right? That's like why I don't go to the, the casino and, and gamble on slots, right? If I'm going to lose my money, I want to lose it because I made the wrong bets in playing blackjack or something, you know? Right. So um, I think in commercial real estate, you can mitigate a lot of the risks because of how you buy and like how we buy. Um, I, I got started in real estate. I was in real estate in 2005, but really more as like a contractor. I had a painting company. I worked for one of the largest home builders as like an intern in the sales side of things. And so, and then I was a real estate agent um, in New York City and I'm in my broker's license, brokering commercial leases and retail leases and stuff. And so I, I was familiar with real estate. I didn't invest until 2009 after the market had tanked. And I remember in 2009 looking at different investors and there were some people who were worth tens of millions of dollars that went bankrupt. And there were some people worth tens of millions of dollars that are now worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And I was like, dude, this is the same market, right? Like everybody's going through the same thing. What's the difference between these, these individuals? And a lot of times, it, it, or almost every time, it came down to um, their, their buying patterns and the, their, whatever their business model was. So I think there's a few things. Markets are always cyclical. As far as what you asked, which is, you know, what's going to happen for 2020 and 2021, I, markets are cyclical, right? Like, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to go back down and it'll come back up, right? So what can you do in the meantime to just have like a steady head and keep on doing deals? Because what I don't want anybody to do is just totally pump the brakes and not do anything because I think, you know, that, that stagnant inaction is what is going to hurt you even more than just doing good deals. So I think you just keep on doing good deals. There were good deals a year ago. There's good deals today. There's going to be good deals a year from now. It's just, what is your buying criteria? And for us, we're always buying at a wholesale price. We are creating appreciation through the value add process. We never speculate on appreciation. We'll hope for it, you know, but, but we're never going to bank on it. Uh, we buy for cash flow. 
meaning the easiest way to step into cash flow is to buy into it immediately, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and, and, and we, don't like, we don't buy land that just sits vacant. It, it needs to have some sort of cash flow component or a way that will at least cover its own operating expenses and its own debt service. Right, um, to mitigate the risk. Right? Exactly. Yeah, and then right. we, we put uh, you know, uh, um, attractive financing terms in place, things that are, that are preferential to us, non-recourse loans, um, you know, fixed interest rates, long amortization schedules, long terms on those loans as well. Doing things like that to make sure that there's no, you know, uh, the bank can't call the loan due at any given time. We make sure that that's not in any of our loans because uh, mm-hmm. we, we don't want is to have a performing property and all of a sudden because the bank gets, you know, scared, all of a sudden they call the loan due and you're like, dude, really? And now I got to go and scramble in order to find a new loan. So we just, we don't do loans with banks that have those kinds of contingencies in their loan docs. So we're doing a lot of things like that. We're buying in B class areas. When the market's good, everybody can afford B class. When the market shifts, all those luxury runners move into more of a workforce B class type housing. So that was the difference between the people who went bankrupt and the people who are now worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, and what their business models differentiated by during the last downturn. So my business model focuses on all those, all those things. Um, hey, maybe it's not the sexiest stuff. Maybe it's not the, um, the get rich quick stuff, but it's get wealthy slow for sure. You know, we know that we will build a billion dollar portfolio over the next few years. My net worth will jump from tens of millions to hundreds of millions. And I'm, I'm a hundred percent confident in what we do and, and what our business model is because of that. So Going back to your original question, Dan, and I love your questions, by the way. You asked some really good cool questions. Um, I, I don't really know what's going to happen, and I'm not even going to speculate. Right. If I find a good deal, I'm taking it down. If it's not a good deal, it doesn't met, meet our, our buying criteria, then, um, then we, we move along, you know, and we keep on sorting through to find better and better deals and keep on finding the good ones. We'll keep on growing our portfolio. And there's going to be some deals that are base hits. There's some deals that are doubles, triples, and some deals that are home runs. And I think if you could just keep on doing all those deals, you don't just wait for home runs because dude, you got to swing the bat, right? You got to hit those base hits in order to get some home runs. And um, if I can average in the double to triple range, dude, you're doing pretty damn well, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That makes, that makes loads of sense to me. And uh, I want to lighten it up from, from a little bit of the doom and gloom. So, so <laughs> let's get, I like to have equal parts intelligence and stupidity in my interviews. So, uh, so outside of real estate, what's the craziest bet that you've done that didn't pay off? And what's the craziest bet you paid that, that paid off big time uh, outside of real estate? Because basically, I want to get an idea of your tolerance for risk as a person, right? <laughs> so outside of real estate. Not outside of real estate. Yes. Um, man, I, I would say... Um, biggest risk that didn't pay off. I'm, I'm not really a gambler. Like I'll go right. and I'll, it, if, if I'm going to go and spend a couple hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars at a show or at a, you know, a, a nice night out, um, I'll take that. I'll say, Hey, listen, I was going to spend this going out to eat and seeing a show or something. Here's 500 bucks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the casino and I'm going to be okay spending $500 and losing $500 because it was the entertainment aspect of it. But I don't go in and, and say, hey, let me, I got to go back to the, the ATM and refill, you know, because I, I think I, I could catch a roll, you know, like I, I, I just don't do that. It's just not what I do. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, if I'm going to do it, it's because it's kind of like a, um, uh, like a philanthropic type thing almost. Like I'll give you an example. Uh, me and my buddies will go out and we'll go out to a nice steakhouse and we'll have a bill that's five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars. Okay. Um, and we'll play, we'll play, it's called tap roulette. And so you can do something on your phone where everybody puts their finger on their phone and it goes around. It's like, dit, 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 dit. and whoever it lands on, you're safe. And whoever the last person is, you do it again, do it again, do it again. Whoever the last person is has to pay the entire bill, you know? And then we'll go to the, the waitress and we'll say, hey, here's, here's the thing. We'll give you a 10% tip guaranteed right now. Good to go. Or, or, I don't know, well, it'll be 10, 15%, somewhere in that ballpark. Mm-hmm. We'll give you a 15% tip right now, guaranteed you're safe. Mm-hmm. Or we can play tap roulette. And if you lose, you get zero tip. But if you win, I'll double the bill. I'll give you a 100% tip. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and every single time I've gotten the waitress to actually play. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, and so we go back and forth and I have her like grab her, you know, co-waitress and then I'll grab one of the other guys. So that way it's, it's more than just a one-time chance. It's like we're going around the circle. And um, if they, if they end up losing, we still give them like a 50% tip. And then if they have a, a 5-0, 50% just because they were the yeah. sport. And yeah. if they end up winning, then they get a hundred percent tip. And so we, we do that once in a while. Cause just cause it's fun. Um, Right. I didn't catch that last part. I saw a video of that. And actually, I was sitting here trying to think, it's, what's a nice way for me to tell you, Tim, you're kind of playing with people's hearts, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and the truth is like, okay, if, if, if the, the 10%, 15% thing was a bluff, and you're actually getting a huge tip anyway, I fully encourage that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I for fully, sure. Yeah, for that, sure. That's really awesome. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think having a little bit is like that. But the reason why I put that question in was because uh, I think that uh, when people get into real estate or, or basically any business, you know, uh, the thing that people repeat is go for it, go for it, go for it, take for the risk, take the risk, take the risk. And so you might get this impression that the person who's teaching is, is uh, just, you know, will we'll throw caution to the wind even on silly things. And, uh, and you don't hit me as that kind of guy. And, and I'm definitely not either. I'm not much of a, of a betting man unless I already know where it's going to go. Right. (laughs) But yeah, I I mean, I I do stuff that's like, you know, I love, I I would go skydiving tomorrow. If you're like, Hey, let's go skydiving. I was like, Mm. let's do it. So I'm a little bit of an adrenaline, adrenaline junkie. I'll go try to climb a mountain. um, And and I'll do stuff like that. That's kind of stupid and risky. Right. But it's not risking anybody else's money. It's not risking anybody else's life. I'm just, you know, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. so I do stuff like that, but not really like, risky risky um not, not that i'm like I'm, I'm pretty risk averse man like I've, i'm yeah. willing to do some stuff but uh i don't like to bet i like to have some sort of control over it like i'm i'm climbing the mountain right so it's like if i screw up it's because of me you know um now jumping out of a plane is a little bit less right <laughs> but, it's just um, your life <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think it's um i don't know i think it's a really good question I, and as far as my risk tolerance goes I, I'm fairly risky. Like I'll, I'll try a new food item on a menu. Like I don't, I don't really care versus other people that just go with the chicken every single time because it's safe. It's predictable. They know, like I'll, I'll, I'll test it out. Um, but I won't just randomly pick an item. I'll say, Hey, what's the best item on the menu? And whatever they say, I go with it, you know, because I know it's tested by somebody else. And there's a little bit of um, reduction of risk if that's the case. So I'm always trying to figure out ways on how to reduce the risk, but still, um, take the risk, take the lead. Right, right. Uh, one trick I learned from a buddy of mine with restaurants, he taught me to, uh, to, to order multiple dishes whenever you go to a restaurant. That way you're not judging the restaurant just on one thing because it's possible that you just ordered the worst thing on the menu. Mm-hmm. But if you ordered like three things and all of them are kind of ho-hum, then it's like, all right, you had your chance. You got my three meals out of me that you would have got anyway. So, uh, I, so, I think- so is that like, you're saying when you go with a group of people, you make sure everybody orders something different or are uh, you personally ordering three meals? Oh uh, yeah. What, what he do, well, it's, it's part, partly Chinese uh, culture because the thing is they don't really like to order something for themselves and like do is, Hey, can Got I have it. some of that? And you stab them with your fork. And so they, yeah, they yeah. don't do so that. It's like family style almost. Yeah. And, and so what they'll regularly do is they'll make sure that they get, you know, at least a couple of appetizers as well as uh, more than one uh, entree, which now I know the French that's not actually proper French for a main course. So she so learns up it. all the time. But, yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, right now it's the beginning of September 2020, just in case anybody didn't catch it. And uh, we, when we knew that this wasn't going to be your average flu season back in February when, when the two of us were in Florida this year. And, and you taught the wisdom of not going for luxury properties just in case something happens because uh, people will have to downgrade. And, and now I can honestly say that it's not as simple as, you know, people aren't working, everyone head for the exits. I mean, like successful people, they might not have enough for a rainy day in their current apartment, but it'll pay for a lot of rainy days in a cheaper apartment. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you focused on these B-class assets uh, because you saw the last crash, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, but for the audience though, uh, uh, where are you right now as far as risk, uh, risk tolerance compared to when we were in Florida uh, back in, in February? Like, has, that, has that changed much? Because I understand that, you know, that, that movement of an entire group of society 
it basically means that you like you're still going to have people paying their bills. You know, they need some place to stay, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it'll just be a rotation, and maybe it's a rotation of properties, maybe it's a rotation of tenants, or something like that. But but uh, has your has your risk aversion changed at all since February? Um, a little bit, but not really much. And maybe we're not taking on as heavy of value add deals. Like before I would buy something that's 50% occupied that needs to be completely turned over. And if it's a low enough cost basis, if we can buy it for cheap enough and turn it around fast enough, I'll still do those deals. But instead of being all in for 60 cents on the dollar, I want to be all in for 50 cents on the dollar, you know, and I'm, I'm padding the numbers a little bit because it's not just, um, you know, occupancy and can tenants pay rent? Do lumber prices have doubled in the past six months? Um, it, uh, supply chains are completely derailed. Like it is almost impossible to get hundreds of, of appliances anywhere. So if you're going to go and renovate a 200 unit apartment building, like you need to order the appliances four, five, six months in advance, and that can delay a lot of different things. And that's just appliances. That, then there's uh, you know, the mechanicals and the HVAC systems and everything else that comes with it. So there's a lot of different parts that are being delayed right now, in addition to tenants not paying rent and, um, you know, rent strikes and all this other stuff that's going on and, and the, the foreclosure or not foreclosure, but the uh, eviction moratorium that's happening right now too. And so like, there's a lot of things like that. Um, here's what I do know. If you manage your property, your property properly and you're screening your tenants, and you're taking care of the property, for the most part, you will not have people trying to game the system, right? I'm sticking to those B-class areas where people have a little bit more pride. They actually, you know, have, a, have some character um, versus like, and, you know, Yeah, trying, yeah trying and, and they don't have the time to sit there and, and plan, hey, how am yeah. I going to do it, right? They're busy yeah. worried about like their boss wants and their coworker wants and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So Yeah, right. absolutely. So, you know, going back to your, your original question, though, of um, has my risk tolerance changed? We are looking for things that are a little bit more occupied and cash flowing than the heavy, heavy value adds that maybe we were doing last year. So, you know, I'm looking for stuff that's more, you know, 80%, 85% occupied with room to bump up the rents. Um, what's helped is interest rates have gone down significantly. And so there's more like values, when, when interest rates go down, that means cap rates come down because cap rates are a function of interest rates. And when cap rates come down, that means values go up. It works inversely. Mm -hmm. So because interest rates go down, cap rates go down, values have gone up. So properties are actually worth more than what they were <laughs> six months ago. But then there's a little bit of a balance because some of them are not performing as well or some tenants are on workout plans. So it, it, it kind of is, it's, it's kind of weird because typically it's very different, you know, like when you go into a, a, a recession or a depression, the values will come down. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's, it's not happening that way right now. So it's different than what 2008 was very right. much so because that was a real estate recession. It was caused because of real estate and loose lending terms. That's not what's happening right now. This is like a fluke, you know, they call it black swan event type thing. It's mm -hmm. more of a punch in the face like uh, like a 9-11 was than anything mm -hmm. else that just kind of stunned everybody and like, whoa, let me, let me, you know, catch my bearings here and figure out what's the next move. That's, that's what I'm seeing is going on right now. So I can tell you for sure though, in the markets that I'm in, which is the Midwest and the Southeast primarily, there's a lot of money coming out of the Northeast, the Pacific um, uh, states, you know, California and, and uh, Washington state, um, and people and out of like South Florida, because it's such a highly inflated market, nobody can get any sort of yield on their money there. So now they're looking for new markets and dude, like some of those are very liberal kind of markets where they're very mm -hmm. tenant friendly in mm -hmm. New York and in California where now there's rent restrictions and there's even stricter rent um, and eviction laws than there are on the, on the national scale right now. And mm -hmm. so because of that, these landlords are like, I'm done. I'm done operating in here. It, took me nine months before COVID to evict somebody. Now it's going to take me two years, three years. Right. So they're like, I'm taking my money and I'm moving it down to Georgia. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're used to getting a 3% cap rate um, in, uh, in uh, New York city. Mm -hmm. They come down to Georgia, they'll buy all day at a five or 6% cap rate. Mm -hmm. So my buildings that, that at best would have ever been valued at a seven, six and a half percent cap rate, 7%. Dude, I have offers like multiple offers on my buildings right now at 6% cap rates, five and a half, 5.75% 5 cap rates. So I'm like, 
do I want to sell? I'm, I'm actually considering it because I don't know if I'll ever be able to get the valuations that I'm getting right now on my mm -hmm. properties um, with the amount of buyers that are, that are flooding into the Southeast. And I have other skill sets where I can find other deals and I can build new construction. They're looking to just jump right now. And yeah. it makes yeah, sense it's a tough choice. because money's cheap, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, um, you know, otherwise I, I have to wait to pay down principal and wait another 20 years for appreciation. Or can I get that money right now and roll it into other opportunities because I'm active on social media because I, I, you know, you have a podcast, you've got deal flow coming in. Like there's, there's people who are bringing me deals on a daily basis that I could take my cash out of those and jump into another great deal over here. So I'm actually considering it. And I can mm -hmm. tell you the market is as weird as it is. It's still pretty hot right now. Right. I've been hearing since uh, March that the other thing that's going on is uh, a demand has dropped, but supply has dropped even more. And, and so, so that's, that just means that the people who are buying, you know, they really want to buy something and, and the properties just aren't there. So, so they're starting to sell at, at higher prices than they would have before. I, I would say that, um, I'd say there's less players in the market, but the people who are still in the market are buying more. Right. That's right. kind of what I'm saying. I, I think like some of the, like lending restrictions have tightened up a little bit. If you don't have a big enough balance sheet, if you don't have enough liquidity, um, if you don't have enough experience, you need to go bring on some sort of outside sponsor or, or co-signer on the loans. Um, but I know the people who are active and doing a lot of deals, they're trying to buy more stuff because they know what's going to happen. Like you can't pump $3 trillion into the economy and, and not expect inflation to occur. So there's a lot of really smart financial people who are taking their money out of the, the you know, the, the market, market and putting it into fixed assets. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of that. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. And, and uh, about the risk uh, aversion that you were talking about, uh, one of the, the most genius parts of your system that, that I learned from you was, was under, understanding how the banks evaluate properties and then doing your deals according to that. Like, like if I were just a, a typical guy, like I remember meeting a guy the other day who uh, he, he flips uh, uh, like uh, running like basketball shoes, right? And, and stuff like that. And, and that they treat those like a commodity, right? It's like I buy it for cheap, sell it for more. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it would occur to me from that kind of background to focus on getting the expense ratio down. And, and so, I mean, like instinctively, uh, like if I was coming from, from my background uh, in, in the different businesses that I've been in, if I saw a building with an 80% expense, expense ratio, I'd run if I hadn't met you, but you see, uh, you see an 80% expense ratio and you say, Oh, goody, because you know, you can actually get that down. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, that shows you, if you have an 80% expense ratio, that shows you something's not happening properly with the property. Like management is loose. They're overspending on maintenance. Um, uh, they're not at the right occupancy. They're not getting the right rental rates. Um, it's, there's probably something distressed with the property. So, I mean, sometimes it's just, it's a bad property and a bad owner and, and um, you don't want that property. Other times it's just bad management and you can jump in there and um, capitalize on an opportunity, you know, because it's, it's severely distressed. It needs physical improvements. It needs managerial improvements. Um, if I know that that, that, that um, uh, operating expense ratio is over 50, 60%, I know that I could probably run it a lot tighter than that. Mm -hmm. um, most of my buildings, especially like the Midwest are somewhere between a 40 to 50% expense ratio because we pay for heat. It's on a boiler system and um, taxes are a little bit higher, you know, in Cleveland than they are maybe in Georgia. You know, my, mm -hmm. my stuff down in Georgia might be closer to 40, 42% expense ratio. Um, and my, my newer construction stuff that's not down in South Carolina or Georgia um, that stuff's at like a 25 or 30% expense ratio because the tenants are paying all the utilities, including water. Um, we have uh, minimal expenses on maintenance. We have, it's easy to lease up. So management uh, and leasing fees are, are pretty minimal. So it just, it depends on the asset on where that is, but that's going to give you a pretty good indication. If you're buying a, a 50, 60, 70 year old building and they're saying that the expense ratio is only 25%, they're probably full of crap. You know, like that's when you're, you're like, all right, let me really run the numbers. Yeah, this guy's full of it. It's not the case. Um, but if they're saying, hey, it's 80% it's expenses, guess what? I think there might be some room to jump in there and, and increase the income, decrease the expenses, have it all normalize around 40, 50%. And um, that's, that's value add. That tells me opportunity, right? right? right. Dollar signs in my eyes.
Yeah, and, and, and it's better for the tenants too. And that part's attractive uh, to me as well, okay. uh, you know, so. But uh, uh, we've already gone too long without me talking about myself. So for those of you watching along because you know Tim and you don't know me, this show is about using attention to detail to adapt to changing markets for your career or business. And with an emphasis, emphasis on what, you, uh, what to do if you have to learn this new thing and you're starting from zero and don't know anyone. So would you mind telling me your entire life story in six words or less? No, I'm kidding. Uh, can, you, can you walk me through uh, uh, how you got started in real estate? I, I remember you said you maxed out your credit cards, right? Yeah, yeah. I, so I, like I told you before, I was, um, was kind of working in real estate in different capacities, industries for a few years before I really started investing. But I moved down to Charleston, South Carolina in 2009 and decided I want to jump into real estate. So I found the cheapest house on the entire MLS. It was listed for 25 grand. And um, that was awesome, right? Because it was a cheap house. The only problem was I didn't have $25,000. So I had to figure out how to get $25,000. And nobody's lending on real estate. It, you know, I, six months after the whole market just completely crumbled because of real estate, mm -hmm. nobody's going to lend on real estate to some punk 23-year-old kid. And nobody's going to lend it to somebody who's done, doing their first deal either, right? Like I got three strikes against me. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't gonna be able to find money. So I needed to figure it out on my own. And I called up my credit card company. I asked them to increase my limit um, significantly. I had a $3,000 limit and I asked them to increase it to a hundred thousand dollars. And they're like, not going to happen. Uh, but they gave me 15 grand. And right. so I had a $15,000 limit. I made an offer on that house at $12,000. They came back at 20. I went back at my highest and best was 14 grand and they ended up accepting it. So I just did like a, uh, one of those balance transfer checks. I wrote myself a, a check from my credit card and um, uh, put it in my bank account. I bought the property with that, with that check. And then I had, I don't know, I think it was like six months of, or three or, I, don't, yeah, I think it was six months of 0% interest on it. So it was like a $200 fee. And that was my total, my entire interest expense on this thing. And I was able to buy it, renovate it. I used some of my own cash to do some of the renovation. I only had a couple thousand dollars, but I used that, put it on a credit card, painted, landscaped, um, put in new, new fixtures and, and found some flooring on Craigslist that I threw in there and um, was all in it for about, I don't know, $19,000 and ended up selling for $33,000, 110 days later to one of the neighbors and made uh, about $13,000, $14,000 on that first deal. Um, not knowing what I was doing in the worst real estate economy ever, the first deal I've ever done. And I was like, let's do it again. So you know, start doing it again. I got into wholesaling and then I started meeting people who had money, but maybe didn't have the time or the bandwidth to take on deals or the knowledge to take on deals. And that's how I, you know, raised my first private money uh, for projects. And, you know, just kind of grew from there, bought a couple of single family rentals, got into small multifamily and just kind of kept on scaling up. Organically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and now that uh, you're in commercial deals, that, that means that there's always multiple investors and, and partners involved in every deal, right? Uh, most of them, some of them I, I do on my own. Um, not all of them do I bring private money, but you know, I, I, I have a couple like, like my office building, you know, it was like an old historic mansion in a really cool part of town that I turned into like little micro offices. So I had nine offices. My team takes up two of them and then I rent out the other seven. That deal I did on my own, not without, but you know, not with any investors. Um, but, but almost every deal I do, I bring on equity investors. So they come in, they, they invest money. I'll go and, you know, let's, let's, I'll give you a quick high level overview. Buying a building that I know is going to be worth $10 million. Very predictable. I know exactly what the expenses are leading into it. I know exactly what the income is going to be leading into it. So I can say, Hey, this building's going to be worth 10 million bucks. I'm all in for six and a half million dollars, 65% of that after repair value with that six and a half million total cost. That's purchase price, renovations, holding costs. I'll be able to get a bank loan for about 80% of that. So let's call it 5 million. Mm -hmm. And then I go and raise money. The other 1.5 million comes from outside investors, equity investors. So they'll say, Hey, Tim, here's $1.5 million. And that could come from one person or 15 people at a hundred thousand a piece. Mm -hmm. From there, I'll pay them a fixed return on their investment. Let's call it 10%. And then I'll give them equity in the deal forever. So they might only get, you know, 15, 20% ownership in the deal, but they have it. They're making a good fixed return while the money's in, invested. I renovate the building. I stabilize the building. I refinance the building in 18 months, pay them all their money back. And then they keep that little piece of equity, 10, 15, 20% in mm -hmm. 
in perpetuity for as long as we own the property. So now they get, you know, let's call it 15% of the uh, uh, depreciation. They get 15% of the cash flow. They get 15% of any refinance proceeds, any 15% of any future sales proceeds. So it's a way that they can have a fixed return on their investment and have uh, um, really build some wealth from that as well. And then cycle their money faster. There's a lot more velocity on their capital than if they invest in a traditional deal. So it, it makes sense for me because it doesn't matter how much money you have. Uh, I know you, you rich tech guys are, are just, you know, limitless, <laughs> the bottomless yeah. pockets of, yeah. of cash. Like right. with, our, with our right fake now. backgrounds of but, our last but, apartments <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is my last new apartment in Taipei. Thai it was like a, like a, I don't know, like a $400,000 uh, condo. That's, that's the view out the window there. But, uh, yeah. It's it, awesome. It, yeah. It's a, it's a green screen. So, <laughs> so, so, so yeah, but I took the photo out of my own apartment and put it on there. So, so that way I look fancy, but I always make a point of pointing out that's fake. This is not real. It's a big fat lie. I don't want to lie to people. And that's, that's because, you know, I find that that's something that's really important. And that goes into my, my next question, yeah. which is uh, before this interview, I was thinking about like the real ballers in this equation. And, and when I think about that, I've been within like six feet of, of billionaires before, but I didn't really have an opportunity to speak. But I was thinking about how you're probably the guy that's buying the champagne for the room at a lot of parties these days, right? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes, you know, I, I think having money makes you more of whoever you are, right? Like there's some people who are like, oh, that guy's a jerk and he's a rich jerk. Well, that guy was a jerk before he had money. You know, he's just an amplified jerk now that he has money. And there's some people who are generous and, you know, when they didn't have any money to give and they're sitting in, in church or somebody asked him for a donation for some philanthropic, you know, uh, whatever, they're, they're digging in their pocket. They're, they're coming up with money, you know, even though they're uh, making $30,000 as a teacher. Right? And then all of a sudden they get into real estate or some other business and now they're making $30 million a year. Guess what? They're, they're taking a, a, an equal ratio, equal percentage of their income and deploying it, maybe even more because they know that um, it'll make a bigger impact. So, um, you know, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm on that side of the equation where, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's cool to make money, but I don't make it for myself. I make it so I can take my friends to cool places. I, make, I take my parents on vacation to, you know, take my, my family, um, to nice restaurants and do cool stuff for other people. You know, it's kind of uh, yeah. why I do it. Yeah. And, and you're, you're, you're still motivated by money though, as well. And, and in a yeah. commercial deal, there's the guy who's running the deal and that's you. And then there are the contractors who can make really big money, but they're overhead nuts, right? Like they're, they're like excavators and stuff. They're, they're big, big, big money. The machines could be worth as much as like some of the sites that they're working on, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but then there are the actual cash investors, and and then there are the mortgage brokers who are financiers. Uh, you 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 were saying earlier that um, uh, you were going for the money, and if somebody is purely interested in the money and nothing else, which one of those guys that I just mentioned uh, are going to have the biggest pot of of gold at the end of the rainbow? I mean, like who's drinking the twelve year old scotch? Who's drinking the 15 year old scotch? Who's drinking the scotch that's old enough to date it? Yeah, I, I think um, that's a great question. So it, I, the way that, I, like I've been in bad business partnerships that were just unfair. And so when I structure my joint venture partnerships, I try to make sure that it's fair across the board. And everybody, depending on how much effort they have to bring and how long they're, they're involved in the project, I, want, I try to make it as balanced as possible where everybody feels that each of the equity uh, splits is very, very fair across the board. Is it ever going to be perfect? No, but it's gonna, it can get pretty close. And so um, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to vary on a deal by deal basis. You know, if, if it's new construction, that's worth more than buying, that's worth more in equity to the project manager than buying something that's totally stabilized, you know, that doesn't need any work. Like it, it, you got to balance that out. Um, uh, you know, uh, how, at, at what risk level are the equity investors at, uh, or, or at what level are the equity investors at risk uh, based on how much money that they're bringing? Right? Like, mm -hmm. are you buying a property that's worth $10 million for $10 million? That's worth a lot. That's a lot more risk and they needed more equity in that deal mm -hmm. versus are you buying a building that's worth $10 million for only $6 million and they're already at a 60% loan to value essentially, right? So there's a lot less risk in that and they don't need to be compensated as, as more, as much with, with equity, you know, but the person who found the deal, guess what? They found, they probably spent a bunch of money on advertising. They had to comb through hundreds of deals in order to find that one that was a, 
a grand slam. And they deserve a little bit more equity in that deal because of the effort that they put in. Um, but that person only worked real hard on that deal for maybe three months, four months, five months versus owning a building for 30 years that somebody has to come in and asset manage it for the next 30 years. Now that's not as much heavy lifting, but it's a little bit of work for a long time. You know, who's got to sign on the loan for the next 30 years versus the equity investors who only have their cash in for 12 or 24 months. So, you know, you're just kind of balancing all those kinds of things out as far as who makes the most money or what side of the coin would I want to be on. I like the side where, um, you're doing the least amount of work and you get the most equity, right? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you balance that out? And yeah. I think what, and, and you're the most passive as well, you know? So I think the private money investors have a grand slam opportunity, you know, to have mm. a fixed return on your investment and get all your money back and then still have equity. And all I got to do is write a check one time. Now you got to work real hard to gain enough money to be able to write that check. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you have the money or you have access to capital or you can, uh, deploy other people's capital into deals um, and you maybe arbitrage the difference there, that is, that's where you want to be. Now, I think mm -hmm. finance and, and the money, finance is the industry that commands all other industries. So if you can control the money, that's really where, where the sweet spot is. Hmm, hmm. Well, there you go. So now we know. And uh, <laughs> you, you're talking about signing on the loan. And uh, so that means you're being a sponsor. And, and to, to try and understand uh, uh, real estate deals as a system. I came up with this idea, something called a sponsor ladder, and, and you, you climbed it from zero. So in order to sponsor a loan, you have to have a net worth equal to the purchase price of, uh, was it a new, uh, was it the purchase price of the commercial loan property amount. or the loan amount? Okay, so the yep. loan amount. Okay, so then, uh, so you have to build up wealth and, uh, and it doesn't have to be liquid, it just has to be on your balance sheet basically, right? Yep, yep, your net worth has to be equal to the loan amount and your liquidity needs to be about 10% of the loan amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, so, but so you're, some... buying, you're buying a, a, a $10 million deal, your loan is $8 million, you need a net worth equal to $8 million, and you need liquidity of around $800,000. Now that can mm -hmm. come from an individual, one person, mm -hmm. or it can come from joint sponsors, multiple people. So if you and I are in a deal together, they'll take our net worth combined, and that mm -hmm. has to be equal to the loan amount, and they'll take our, our liquidity combined, and that has to be equal to 10% of the loan amount. And that's, it, that'll vary based on the lender, but that's typically like the Fannie Mae's and Freddie Mac's and like the agency lenders out there. Right, right. And I know that you've actually done deals, uh, uh, like, like you've gotten loans from, from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I just need you to say, yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. <laughs> there you go. So, so it's just, you know, because not everybody can cl claim that, right? But, yeah. uh, but the other thing that you mentioned earlier is that someone in the deal, it's not enough to just have enough money. You also have to have uh, it's somebody on the team with experience doing deals of around that size, right? Mm -hmm. it, and it's not like money is the only way to do a deal. Okay. So uh, and, and that can be you, Dan, or it could be, maybe you have the cash, maybe you have the net worth, but maybe you haven't done those kinds of deals. You just need a very qualified management company that will be also underwritten by the lender. Like they're going to mm -hmm. be interviewed and everything. So they want to make sure that um, all the T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and somebody's going to be able to step in and, and manage this thing properly. So you can get around that one a little bit if you have a great uh, vendor, contractor, you know, management company that, you can, that you're working with. Um, but the other two are pretty, uh, pretty firm. Right, right. So, uh, but the main advantage of being the sponsor on your own deal is that you get more equity, right? Yeah, typically. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so what structure do you do? Yes. Right, that makes sense. All right, so change of gears then. Uh, you've got enough irons in the fire right now that I'm sure it's getting tough to like, like at some time to keep track of some of them because it, it's running on all autopilot and other things like that. But, but uh, as I mentioned, you know, I came from tech, so I was automating, I was building forms, handling security, CRMs, mailings, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had to learn uh, as a part of that, the SEC regulations about advertising to investors. Uh, I'm, and I'm sure you've had some 506B and 506C offers in the past, right? Is it, is it yeah. both? Or? Okay. Yeah, we've had both. Okay. And, and, uh, and, you had, and to do that, you had to have Fatty or someone register with the SEC, and that's the rules to publicly advertise to investors, right? Yep. Yeah. 506B, okay. or 506B is friends and family. 506C is public advertisement. And uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So then uh, uh, just to repeat that for the audience then, so, so Coke, for example, or McDonald's, they can advertise to everyone, 
but you have to register with the SEC before you can advertise for investors. Correct. Okay. okay. So uh, what's the barrier to entry for being able to do that registration and publicly advertise for investors? It's like 15K and a lawyer or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you hire an SEC attorney or like a, a securities attorney. And you know, it's typically somewhere between 10 to $20,000 um, depending on how complex and comp complicated your, uh, your fund is going to be. But you can create a fund to do pretty much anything you want. Whatever you want to do, you could put in. You just have to put in the documents and disclose everything. As long mm -hmm. as it's disclosed, you can do pretty much anything you want, structure it any way that you want. There are an a, a infinite amount of ways to structure an investment fund. Um, depending on the type of fund it is, like friends and family, 506B means it can be accredited or non-accredited, meaning... Uh, they have a net worth over a million dollars or under a million dollars. Doesn't matter. There's some income uh, uh, qualifications and stuff too, but uh, it can be anybody that you know and you have a pre-existing relationship with. So that's 506B. 506C is general solicitation, meaning you can go out and take a billboard out and say and post on social media and put it on wrap your car with hey invest with me, but you can only take accredited investors. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that, they have to have a net worth over a million dollars. They have to have an income over 200,000 if they're single, 300,000 if they're married uh, for the past couple of years. And the expectation of doing that same thing this year. Mm -hmm. um, and their net worth cannot, inc cannot include their primary residence either. So right. there's some complications on that, uh, but it, it opens you up. The thing that I found though is with, with a, a general solicitation type of, of structure, what I found though is you can go and generally solicit, but who's going to write you a check who's never met you before? Right. Like, like it's just easier to go to friends and family and build it that way and stay inside the lines. Um, unless, unless, like I'm a little bit of a different animal because I have the education platform and I have a pretty heavy social media following. Mm -hmm. So because of that, people kind of, they feel like they already know me and mm -hmm. they know what I stand for. They know what my core values are. They know what kind of deals that I do. So I can, I can do a 506 C and I can generally solicit on social media and then people will hit me up and say, Hey dude, I'm in. Right. Cause I've, I've been following you for the past year and a half on social media and I see what you're doing. I love that. And I want to jump in. So there's benefits and downsides to both of them. It just kind of uh, depends on what you want to do, but we create a new investment fund for every single deal that we do. We raise on a deal by deal basis. We don't have like an ongoing fund where you just generally invest in it. And then we take that money and we allocate it to different projects. It is, if I'm going to bring you, if I'm buying one, two, three main street, we're creating one, two, three main street, LLC and one, two, three main street fund. And mm -hmm. then you're going to invest in one, two, three main street fund. You're going to know exactly what the uh, financials are for that deal. And that deal exclusively, it's on its own little Island and you're only investing in that project. And that it's easy for investors to wrap their head around that versus trying to figure out what their return is going to be based on having money in all these different, um, uh, in this general fund that invests in all these different projects. So, right. And, and even though they won't be, uh, uh, there's no recourse going after those individual uh, investors. Uh, they're also listed as an owner on the LLC uh, in your system. And, and for me, I, I just brought that up because like that'd be important to me as, as a digital security guy. I want to see, it's like, okay, where, where does it show that, that it's not just done on a handshake or something yep, like that. Yep. But, but that, uh, that actually wasn't where I was going with that last question about the uh, SEC. I actually oh, wanted, to, I wanted to ask, uh, no, 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 definitely don't apologize because it was supposed to be kind of covert anyway. See, I personally would be on extremely shaky ground to answer this next question, but <laughs> you're not. My question we'll is, out of the, the thousands or tens of thousands of guys doing real estate deals that you've met, have you ever even met one that wouldn't be interested in meeting another possible investor with money to deploy, you know, like more than your smaller investors. Have you ever seen somebody who's like, oh, you got money, you want to deploy it? No, no. Uh, meaning, meaning they have too much money? Yeah, or yeah. In other words, it like, so, so a real estate investor who's not interested in meeting more investors is just like, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, no. It, it, it's pretty ridiculous to no, me. Every, everybody, everybody that I know who's actively doing, like I know some big guys, guys yeah. with billions and billions of properties, uh, I mean, I, I know, I, I don't know him personally, but he's here. Like I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, as we're, we're doing this right now. Right. Um, just moved my family down here last week, but like the largest multifamily owner in the country is out of Charleston, South Carolina. And this guy's got 500,000 units in the United States and another 
somewhere between another 500,000 to almost a million outside of the country. Uh, he's one of the, I think he's also the largest uh, multifamily owner in England and it is crazy how much, but like I just read an article beginning part of this year that he just raised $2 billion from an investment fund. This guy's still looking for money. You know, it doesn't matter how much property you have and how big you are. You're always sourcing deals and you're always sourcing money. If you're doing mm -hmm. those two things, that helps you take deals down. Now, what mm -hmm. helps you keep deals is operations, right? We're always refining your operations and dialing in that piece. Uh, that's how you make sure you don't lose any property. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you know, the, the money is always welcome, but the, the SEC just doesn't allow advertising without registering. Mm -hmm. Fun. All right, so, uh, <laughs> so with these uh, apartment complex deals, you said you had like 4,000 units, and uh, I, I know that uh, 100 plus units uh, per deal are better for you. Uh, so, so we're talking about big numbers here and there's plenty of cash flow and on paper wealth to go around. So at the end of the day, I think it's all about trust, right? Like, like you know, I'm talking about uh, how you have to have this, this net worth in order to get the loan in the first place. You have to have this experience to get the loan in the first place. And, and, and the question is how can the bank trust their clients money to you if you don't have enough skin in the game. Like there's, there's no real way to gain that trust to show that you have a similar, than, than to just show that you have a similar net worth and that you're with people who've managed similar size deals. But, uh, but changing from there, you're huge on social media and you say that building a social media following should be a priority for, for like every professional out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, if you're not on social media, social, I bet. <laughs> if you're not on social media, um, you need to be like, I, I can't tell you how impactful it's been for me and my business. And I never like, I wasn't intentional about it when I first got started. I just truly believe that there's an abundance of wealth out there and everybody can have it. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm so like pro entrepreneurship and having your own business and really controlling your future versus letting somebody else dictate it that I've always just shared ideas and principles and what I was doing in real estate investing and how other people get, and then all of a sudden it accidentally turned into people sending me messages of like, dude, I have this other deal. I don't know what to do with it. Do you want to buy it? Let me sell it to you. Or I have, Hey man, can I buy any deals from you? Are you selling anything? Or, Hey man, I have some money. Can I invest with you? Or, Hey man, like I need to learn this stuff. Do you have any formal coaching or platforms and like that? And so it just turned into some other stuff for me. Um, and so then I realized, oh man, what if I was actually intentional about this and always putting social media content out there? And now it's just kind of amplified. It's taken on a life of its own. And I have um, some amazing uh, people that connect with me and follow me on, on Facebook and uh, people I've done deals with and people in my masterminds and things like that, that have really created a lot of opportunities for everybody because of it. So um, again, it's one of those things where, hey, you can go out and you can grab coffee with somebody for an hour, but that's a one-on-one -on -one activity. And you develop a relationship with one person, but on social media, you post. I had a post on Sunday that has 550 likes on it. You know, mm -hmm. like over 500 people had seen that and got value from that. And, and that post might've taken me 30 minutes to put together or something, you know? So like, think about the efficiencies of how much more reach you have and how you can build relationships. And again, these are people who feel like they know me to the point where they're willing to write me a check for hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and or write me a check for tens of thousands just to be in one of my coaching programs or my, plat, like my, my mastermind or something like that, or invest hundreds of thousands of dollars with me just based on social interactions on Facebook. Like it's amazing the, 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 how, how deep the connections can get through an online medium like that. that I, that's the best way to segue into my next question I can possibly imagine because uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell you about what I'm up to because I think there's some fairly novel and not obvious parts to, to what I'm up to. As a matter of fact, I, I was meaning to ask you uh, if, if you did any more research on me and because uh, uh, there's plenty of weird stuff out there. Uh, you know, I, can, I, can, I can go into more detail about that more uh, uh, after, but um, you're going to be the first person to know this outside of my, uh, my innermost circle. So this, this show here, Figure It Out, already has 200 different topics that have been released, and I, I released the first one about two weeks uh, before I met you to today. So, so over 200 videos have been, uh, have been released, and if you play it back to back with no breaks, it's about three days long so far. And, and uh, I chose the topics to tell, uh, to tell any of my descendants the things that I think are hard to find out about 
but extremely important. Uh, even if they don't know anyone, you know, cause like I've seen families get estranged before, right. Where, you know, they just don't talk with her, but understanding real estate is one of those things. Um, I already asked the Mathis twins what their plans for their daughters were regarding uh, real estate. Uh, so, so about real estate, you just uh, started a publishing company for kids, uh, for kids books and you focus on motivation in that, uh, from, from my take. So I'm sure, uh, with your kids, you're teaching them how to be successful. But what's your plan as far as steering them towards real estate, which, which obviously it works for you, uh, versus uh, letting them do whatever they want, like get a degree in interpretive dance or something like that? Yeah, yeah. And I think um, that's, always, that's always tough. Like you see all these entrepreneurs and they're like, yeah, I'm grooming my son or my daughter to take over the business. Um, listen, if they want to take it over, awesome. I'll hand it off to them and I think it'd be amazing. And I, I, I'd love it if they did that. Um, I think true legacy doesn't come from passing down treasure and estate and property. I think it comes from passing down mindset of how do you go out and do it on your own in mm -hmm. any industry that you want to go and do it in, you know, and understanding success philosophies and achievement principles and things like that is really important. That's why I created little legacy library, which is the kids books that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so for my kids, they're going to, they're going to know real estate just by like my daughter's standing right here as you see her mm -hmm. and she's hearing these words and she might not interpret all of them and, and conceptualize all of them right now, but she's going to get this nonstop for the next 15 years of her life. And she's going to know more about real estate on accident than most people will ever learn about real estate and investing and wealth. And just because that's the conversations that I have, um, it's the conversations that I have with her. Like if I, if I brought her over here right now, I'd say, Hey, what are the three steps to building wealth? And she'll tell you, she'll be like, you got to earn money. You got to save money. And you got to invest your money, right? Like mm -hmm. that's important. I was like, what's the difference between an asset and a liability? And she'll tell you, one of them puts money in your pocket. The other one takes money out of your pocket. Give me some examples. Hey, businesses and you know, real estate and this and that and all, all these other things. So like she knows those things and she's five years old. She just turned yeah. five. Right. Um, so she's going into kindergarten, right? And everybody's trying to learn their ABCs. She's giving them financial advice, um, right. Right. Which, which to me is transcends industry. If she wants to be a dancer or she wants to you know, go and paint pictures of art uh, for the rest of her life. That's okay. And I'd love for her to do that. I actually love it. I, and she wants to be a musician or whatever. Uh, but I want her to be financially secure and understand finance uh, uh, because economics is what makes the world go round. So like you still have to be um, uh, at least responsible enough to understand how to, how to buy assets, how to cash flow assets, and then let those assets cover your lifestyle. Then you can go do whatever you want with your lifestyle. And so if she's buying businesses and selling businesses and she wants to do that on a full-time basis or buy real estate and sell real estate on a full-time basis, great. If she wants to do something else, at least she knows how to go out and uh, subsidize her art ventures because tough to make a lot of money in art, right? Like, mm -hmm. but she can make money here and then it covers all of her lifestyle expenses and then she can go do the things that she loves. And that's really, I think, real legacy because it allows them to um, really focus on what they want to do and not just you know, being a vehicle that maybe they're not totally passionate about. Right. And, and I, I like that uh, whole approach because it also takes people away from, you know, I'm just going to find a significant other, right? So I'm not saying necessarily it's, yeah. it's, it's a husband or, 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 you know, spouse or whatever, a, sig a significant other. You shouldn't have to wait around for a significant other to pay for all your bills. Mm -hmm. You know, you should be self-sufficient. And then that way, you know, that the reason why you're having that relationship uh, with that person is because you want to, not because you have to. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, so that's, that's about legacy. And the weird thing I'm doing for my legacy on top of having all these questions that are for my kids and anybody who'd uh, be interested in these tough subjects that are tough to find out how to learn. Um, I'm basically like what I'm doing by doing that is I'm uploading my personality to the cloud. You know, like if you ask me in person about like politics or religion or something like that, what I recorded is basically the limit of what I'd tell you anyway. Yeah. So, so between that and one other thing, I basically just got the opportunity to become immortal. And that's, that's going to be happening in the next uh, 30 days or so. I'm getting my own deep fake digital avatar of myself from the same guys who did the ad that uh, David Beckham did for malaria. And they got him to speak like 30 languages or something. Yeah. So, so that way I'm also providing my family with the, the ability to just type any words they want and a computer will make those words come out of my 40 year old face 
in 30 languages if they want to, uh, even though I only actually only speak like two and broken versions of like three others myself. But, but if my kids want me to say, you know, if, if they want me to say I love you, they can do that, you know, and, it, it, and of course that's true, right? But if they want me to say that Santa Claus is real, I can, because that's also true. <laughs> and, but, uh, but of course, uh, it's not really immortality unless I get, I, I can also answer most of life's difficult questions from beyond the grave. And, and that's all on YouTube now. But, but your entire model is, is, is based on building an empire and a legacy. So, so what's a legacy for you? That's my question. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to, I think people should make as much money as they possibly can inside the time that they dedicate to finance and economics, right? right? I don't think that should be everything, but inside the time that they dedicate, and if that's eight hours a day for you, five days a week, great. Uh, I think you should make as much money as you possibly can because that allows you to make bigger impact in society. Like, dude, you can't build a hospital. You can't send kids to a better school. You can't buy books for, for children if you don't have the, the resources to do that. So I think you should make as much money as you possibly can inside the time that you dedicate to finance and economics. And, um, and I'm, I'm trying to do that with real estate, right? And um, that's, that's what I'm doing. But I think for me, I'm going to make as much money as I possibly can. And I'm going to give all of it away. My kids are going to get some badass houses, right? Like I'm sitting on a, an oceanfront house in Charleston, South Carolina right now. And they're going to get this in their trust. They're also going to get our house in Cleveland, um, which is less exciting than this one. <laughs> but, uh, and then they're going to get some sort of, uh, I don't know, I'm going to buy like a, something up in the mountains, a lodge or something with a bunch of land. And they're going to get that. So they're going to get a good amount of real estate just to, for secondary primary homes, that kind of stuff. Otherwise, the rest of the money is going to nonprofits and, and other stuff um, when I'm gone. But my kids are going to have real legacy, which is they know how to build this stuff on their own. They're going to be like, dad, I have all my own money. I, I don't want your friggin' property. So go do whatever you want with it. That's my goal. That's my, my hope is that my kids uh, can figure this out for themselves and they don't even want or desire any of my money. And then I know that I did something right, you know, yeah. it's not just, not just them, but I want to make sure that I'm making an impact for other people. And I think that that's true legacy. I think, you know, Dan, you become a billionaire and you're like, oh, you know what, what helped me out was going to this event uh, for, of this guy, Tim Bratz, and um, helped me set me on the path to go out and buy real estate a certain way and made a billion dollars from it. And thanks for that. You wrote about it in a book. That to me is legacy, right? Like you're right. dedicating and uh, just mentioning me and mentioning my name. I think that that's, um, uh, that'd be pretty powerful. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for being here today. And uh, it, you in the audience, that's up there. Uh, if you have any, uh, if you know any apartment buildings for sale, or if you live in a building that isn't being taken care of, please get in touch with us. You can go to figureitout.com forward slash Tim Bratz deal. That, uh, that link is inside the description. Uh, and, uh, but let's do this again uh, soon, Tim. Thanks yeah, a lot man. for being here. This is fantastic. I appreciate all the value you bring in and uh, all the amazing questions you ask. So uh, I appreciate our relationship. Glad we're friends. And if there's ever anything that I can do, man, don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you again. Awesome. Thanks.